Hey everybody, thank you for joining me today. I'm Andy Schweiger up here at Schweiger Vineyards. Uh, we've been doing, this is now our fourth week of doing webisodes, reaching out into the homes of our customers. And we really appreciate your support over all the years. And we figured during this interesting time, well, why not think creatively and start doing virtually, virtual tastings? And as questions pop up, they've kind of been inspiring me to well, let's delve deep into that subject. Let's go down that rabbit hole. So I think it was about two weeks ago, somebody asked me if we would ever consider using screw caps on our wines. And yes, we have, and yes, we did. But I thought, hey, why don't we go deeper into that subject rather than just talking about it then? So they were very patient and held their question. But first, many of you here today are because we have partnered with Fly With Wine and we actually have a virtual door prize today and i'm loving building the suspense and our winner winner today of a 12 bottle vingard valise is michael sullivan so michael um i believe i saw you pop in the room so please send a hello message to paula to uh do your victory lap because part of this was you had to be here in the webinar to win for those of you who did not win, uh, we will have an offer from Fly With Wine at the end of this webcast. So stay tuned and take advantage of that. So as winemakers, we need to close our bottles of wine for the obvious reason that if we didn't close it, when we turned it upside down shipping it to you, it would all spill out. Uh, more importantly that, we do need to protect it from air. Now, we're not trying to completely eliminate the air because as I'm talking today, I'm gonna to try and illustrate that a small amount of air is actually important to the aging of the wine in the bottle. So as winemakers, we have a choice of a variety of closures. Obviously the centuries old one is cork and cork can't fail, right? It's been around for centuries, uh, but unfortunately sometimes it does fail. Uh, however, as winemakers, we do have a variety of other stoppers at our disposal agglomerated cork. Those are those uh, particle board looking corks that they're held together with glue. Uh, technical corks are essentially the same as an agglomerated cork, but they put a little disc on either side. I'll show those to you later on. Uh, recently, in the last 15 years, some wineries have started using glass stoppers. Of course, there's synthetic corks. I think the Zork, I didn't even bother putting the Zork in. I think the Zork has gone the way of the Dodo. And of course, screw caps, which many of you are familiar with that Schweiger uses. But I thought it would be first to look more closely at where cork comes from, how it's produced, and how it actually is a very sustainable prod product. Of all the closures I mentioned, cork is the one you're going to most likely run into. So I thought it was worth giving a little time. And fortunately, um, I had the privilege of going to Portugal and seeing the cork harvest. So as we're going through here, I'm actually going to share some videos that I shot in Portugal back in 2015. Now this first video, I have to apologize. I don't know what my camera was doing, uh, but the cork on that tree is going to do a few weird things and no, it's not the tree getting wavy and no, the LSD from that last rock concert you went to is not kicking in. There's just something funny happening with the lenses. Is uh, these two gentlemen are very carefully cutting into the bark without damaging the cambium layer. Um, all cork is stripped by hand. Uh, the Portuguese government does not allow any mechanical stripping because it is too easy to get into that lower layer of bark and kill, damage or kill the tree. The axe they're using is called a machada and it's a very narrow blade. I'll show that to you after this video. Um, it's a very fragile, soft metal, so that if they swing it too hard and on anything like cork, it's not going to damage the cambium layer of the tree. As you can see, as they're peeling this all off, there is still a very fine layer of bark left on that tree. And this is a close up of the machada, and you can see how fine that blade gets, and even all the way along the hilt of it it's still a very thin blade and comes up very gently. So there's no sharp edges that can scratch or damage that cambium layer. So 
So here's more guys pulling this apart and making more of these slabs. And you know, I just like to stress, because the first time people see cork being harvested, they may think it's killing the tree. But these workers are very careful. I mean, these trees are their livelihood. Uh, well cared for, a cork tree can grow up, to, to, can uh, stay healthy for up to 200 years, being harvested every eight to 10 years. As this video is playing, Paul, did we have any questions come in by any chance? Uh, Michael says, yes, I love the wine case. Thank you. And David comments that he and his wife were in Australia last year, tried many wines with screw caps. We had some wines shipped home and was amazed at how well the screw caps worked. Uh, David, I see you asked what causes cork taint. We will be getting into that. I'm slowly getting used to Zoom and today's an easy one where I'm sitting at my desk. I can actually uh, see some of these as they come in, but I'm minimizing so I don't get too distracted as we're going along. So once that cork is all harvested, uh, the bark is allowed to air dry for six to 12 months. They do this so sap can leach out. Also rain, rain is going to fall on the wood a little bit. The harvest is primarily conducted um, in late May through June. Uh, that's the optimal time when the tree is just really starting to wake up for summertime. Now, I do like to point out that many cork companies buy their bark already harvested from co-ops. Uh, some cork companies don't even process their own cork. They purchase from several different producers. There's actually some mom and pop operations where guys like that you saw who'd work for independent contractors will keep a few slabs and they have a punching machine in their own garage and they'll punch out a thousand corks over the weekend and sell them to a co-op. I only work with cork producers who have put in a long-term lease for a section of forest. And those are their, their trees to manage and maintain. So it's on them to make sure the trees are well cared for because it's their own investment. So they're not going to over harvest them. Many cork companies will leave the bark on the floor until it's convenient for them to get a truck and bring it out. Uh, M.A. Silva, the people who took me to Portugal in 2015, bring all that cork to a yard the same day it's harvested. So you're not getting as many bugs in the wood. You're also having a less exposure to the potential of mold growing on that bark. And mold, along with chlorination, are the two primary factors involved in TCA, cork taint. And again, we'll come to that later. Andy, someone After, just chimed in with a question about, is there a grading system for the quality of the cork? Yes, there is a grading system to quality of the cork. And that will be, I think, in the second, the next video after this one. Right now, all that bark is being held in a bundle. And they will actually take those bundles. So this is the first step in the processing of all the cork. And they have these large, large boiling pots. And all the cork is boiled, not only to make the wood more pliable, more porous, but also to kill any uh, bacteria, any mold, or any insects that were harboring in that cork bark while it was drying. So as they're pulling this out, they'll get that hook eventually. Um, once they pull this out, all the bark is of a consistent moisture level, so it's going to make it easier to process. Now, today, all this boiling takes place in chlorine-free water. The two major contributors of cork taint are chlorine and mold. And it's when you get chlorination of a mold byproduct, you create a compound called trichloroanisol. For your chemistry geeks, I'll actually put up a diagram in a little bit.
you can actually see a number four on a piece of bark coming out right now. That actually, that number four is actually all the way back out to the forest. They will go out in years and actually mark the trees for specific years to harvest. So that four, that was a tree that was actually supposed to have been harvested in 2014, and they chose to skip it that year. The nice thing about only harvesting your trees every eight to 10 years, you can abbreviate the years as uh, one digit numbers. So that's that bark coming out of the steamer. Now for the person who asked about the grading, this is the first step in the grading process. They're gonna take those slabs and they're going to have senior employees. Actually, there's some audio, so I'll be quiet right now. attention to these these plates here they have all the information needed oh, I was trying to stop it uh, for you guys what he's doing there is as he's dragging that knife along the side let me get back here there I think I got it so as he's dragging that knife along, as Moro said, not only is he looking at the thickness of the bark, but he's also looking at what we call lenticels. And lenticels are those dark pores that go through the cork. Hang on one second. All right, there we go. I forgot I had this back here. Hopefully I don't mess up the sharing. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share for a second. So this is a strip of cork that actually the holes have already been punched out of. And as they're looking at that cross section, they're looking for these lenticels because the more of those dark lines that are there, that's actually going to show up in the end of the cork. And that's, in a smaller degree, it can be a visual defect. Um, as they get larger, when you look at the cross section, those lenticels actually become the pores within the side of the cork. And you think this is pretty cool and a novelty item, you're gonna see how this is actually something that they make there in the factory and they actually let me grab this scrap and stick a bunch of corks back in as they're being punched. Okay, now let's see if I can turn this back on successfully. All right, we're back to the slideshow, everyone. Give a thumbs up. Good. So now that they've sorted all those slabs of bark, they actually go about, when the case is at M.A. Silva, they go about two hours north to their main processing facility. And there they take those slabs and with a bandsaw, cut them into slabs, very much like the one that I'm holding up here. And they're preset for the thickness of corks that they're going to be punching. Normal length of a cork is about 49 millimeters, about two inches long. Less expensive wines can do with about 44 millimeters or shorter. And in some wines, as short as an inch long. Um, a shorter cork is going to lead to more gas exchange, which is going to give you a shorter shelf life. Higher end wines meant to be laid down for longer, like Dedication, Gate, and Monterre, will sometimes opt to go with a 54 millimeter cork. So now, those slabs they were cutting, you remember this? They have a punching machine, which actually has a hollowed out drill bit 
that is operated by foot. So once I start this video, you're gonna see this person operating the puncher advancing this piece of bark along while advancing the puncher with a foot pedal. There we go. You may be thinking this looks low tech. This is actually modern technology for punching quarks. So after all those corks have been punched, the hoppers that they've been dropped into go into a mechanical sorter. And there's a high speed optical camera that actually captures a photo of both ends of the cork as well as the entire barrel of the cork. And it's showing all those lenticels that I showed you. And it comes up with a summary of how many square millimeters of that cork is black, has that porous lenticel and it will then sort them accordingly. And we had a question is uh, from Molly. Is it the same technique no matter who makes the corks? Pretty much yes. Um, they all have to be cut into the strips like you saw. They all have to be boiled to be more pliable. Um, the punching is pretty much the same. Many cork producers don't have access to the mechanical sorter, so they have to do more hand sorting. And hand sorting can be done as simply as just picking up a cork and looking at it. Of course, when you're trying to do hundreds of thousands of corks a day, that can be very daunting. So they'll typically have machines that will convey, lay them out, conveyor them out. So these ladies are verifying, they're sorting for a particular grade on that date. They're all going to be a uniform length. They're all going to be a uniform diameter. What they're looking is, are these making the grade that they don't have too many pores, too many lenticels? And they're looking for other flaws, such as chips, bore beetle damage, that the optical sorter may have missed. If you're purchasing a higher grade cork, they may receive a second or a third or even a fourth hand sort. So that's kind of how cork comes to us. Uh, from that point on, it will be sanded down, it will be polished. It, they typically, for us here in the United States, they'll be shipped over uncoated because before they, when a winemaker like myself orders the cork, I then have my brand that goes on it and they get printed, they get branded on the sides, and they get coated with a very fine paraffin coating that just helps the cork slide in the bottle of the corking process and also helps it come out at the end of cork, at the end of, at the end of the life of the cork, which is when you pop it and enjoy the bottle of wine. So Andrew had a couple other questions from John. Um, yes. He would like to know if all Schweiger wines use the same size cork and then Larry was asking if you were given a free trip to visit the cork forest by your cork supplier. So John, we use, we used to use all the same length cork. All of, most, um, most wine bottles use the same diameter cork. It's very rare that you're going to have a wider diameter cork. In terms of length of the cork, uh, we've always used 49 millimeter corks, the two inch corks. Um, actually, <laughs> I just pulled that out. These are all 53 millimeter corks in here. Now, when I worked at Cane Vineyards, uh, Cane 5 is designed to be laid down for a long time. And when we started doing dedication here, you know, Cane was a major inspiration for what we did here with dedication. 
so I went with 54 millimeter corks. Uh, why the 54 millimeter corks? First off, they're going to last even longer. They're going to let less air come into the wine. Um, and it's also more cork that's going to have to degrade if the wine is stored in too dry of a space. And then the second question was, Paula? Uh, if uh, you went with your cork supplier? Oh, yes, yes. So that was, I, I was stunned. Uh, trips to Portugal by cork suppliers, trips to France uh, by barrel suppliers um, are very rare and usually reserved for large corporate buyers. I've been buying from M.A. Silva for well over 18 years. And in 2015, I got a call from my sales rep asking me if my passport was up to date because they wanted to take me to Portugal. So it was a huge honor. I was floored because that's something that small producers like myself are rarely invited to do. It was an amazing trip. Did it influence me to always buy their course again? No, actually uh, the following year, I received better quality samples from another cork supplier at a fair price. And so I called M.A. Silva up and said, can you match this quality at this price? And they at first said no. And then they said, can we do an upsort and resubmit? And I said, yes. And I gave them half of my business that year because they worked hard to get my business. But at the end of the day, you know, I have a friend who works for a high tech company and she was never allowed to accept gifts because their bosses were afraid it would influence her. And to me, the quality of what goes into our product um, is so important that I'm never going to let anything like a free trip influence me. But hey, it was a lot of fun and a huge privilege to be invited. So somebody earlier asked a question about cork taint. And to me, I think that's the big reason why we've seen fewer and fewer wines closed in cork. Cork taint is caused by trichloroanisole. Now, I realize phenols, those of you who watched uh, two weeks ago when I did my tannin talk, you're going, oh no, it's Andy with those weird hexagonal rings again. Well, Lignin, tree bark, is a phenol. So that ring you see on the left, that's what we're starting from. Now, somehow, if chlorine gets introduced to that lignin, you're going to form a compound called trichlorophenol. Now, where's that chlorine coming from? It can come from, it can come from, here we go, does that work? Yes, it can come either from chlorine bleaching when you bring that bark into the facility and you're boiling it in chlorinated water, you're going to be transforming that phenol into trichlorophenol. It can also come from agrochemicals. You saw out there when they were harvesting that bark, uh, they're letting the slabs fall right on the forest floor. And you wanna maintain your forest floor, you don't want it to be surrounded by uh, weeds. And some, forests, the forestry people realized, hey, it'll be a lot easier if we don't have a lot of weeds. So they would go through with Roundup and spray the forest floor. Well, most of most agrochemicals used for killing weeds have chlorine in them. So if you're spraying weed killer near your cork tree, the cork tree is naturally going to pick up the chlorine and transform that into trichlorophenol in your bark. Now, TCP, trichlorophenol, by itself is not necessarily bad. It has a sweet, not unpleasant smell. Uh, those of you who have um, been stay at home for your wife uh, or children for a while, the smell of TCP is very similar to other things you'd put over your face to make somebody go to sleep. No, nope, not that I'm advising that. Uh, but what happens then is you can have microbial transformation of TCP. Uh, when you have mold growth, even if you have mold present, uh, those mold spores will convert. They'll actually add one carbon atom onto that, uh, that hydroxyl group goes into a, a carbon hydroxyl group and that forms trichloroanisole. That TCA 
at very, very low levels mutes the fruity aromas, but it's those medium to higher levels that gives you that moldy newspaper, that wet dog or damp basement. Now we call it cork taint, but cork taint isn't fair. Uh, natural cork isn't the only culprit. Um, cellar practices uh, used to involve very heavy use of chlorine and entire cellars were tainted. I worked at a winery in the late 80s where every Friday we would put on respirators and put on rain suits and we'd open up the fire hose and spray down the entire barrel room floor and then go through about five gallons of granular chlorine and just spread chlorine all over the barrel room floor, scrub, 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 hose it down. Well, you're hosing it down, you're using a fire hose, that chlorinated water is now splashing up on the barrels, it's splashing on the walls, and most importantly, it's going down in the drains. If you've ever had the displeasure of having to repair a drain, you know those things are filled with mold. Uh, what happens when you chlorinate mold? You get TCA. There are entire cellars that have cork taint. You do this in a cellar that has wooden walls, and that wood is going to always be putting off TCA, which can be absorbed into the wine. So a lot has changed in modern winemaking since the 80s to avoid that taint cellar. Um, I'm very fortunate. Like I said, I, I grew up working with chlorine in the cellar. And believe me, chlorine is an amazing cleaner, and we miss it. Uh, however, about the time we all started to realize that chlorine was bad in the cellar is the same time we started building our own winery here at Schweiger Vineyards. So we've actually never used chlorine inside of our cellar. Now there are other ways for it to come in um, to the winery and actually we'll talk about that when we come to rubber stoppers. Actually, I don't think I put up a slide on that. Uh, why don't I use synthetic corks? Well, some of the earliest generation of synthetic corks, uh, I wasn't in a purchasing position, but uh, Paula and I played volleyball at Chateau St. Jean with the purchasing agent. And he handed me a fact sheet and said, hey, have you ever heard of these? Uh, what's your thought on it? I looked at it and I was looking through there and I actually saw that the binder for the plastic included trichlorophenol, a precursor to TCA. And lo and behold, that first generation of uh, synthetic corks, actually after two years in bottle, started causing cork taint in corked wines. Now, not only have they removed chlorinated water from the process, but there is now testing for the presence of TCA. And it's very expensive. Normally you would have a batch tested and they would test 1,000, they would test a bale of 1,000 corks and pull a representative sample out of that and test those corks. Uh, starting this year with my corks for my 2020 bottling that are arriving here in about two weeks, uh, I'm actually paying to have every single cork tested for TCA presence. So while I'd like to see there is a, say there is a 0% chance of you getting a corked bottle of Schweiger Vineyards, it's still possible. Um, but at least now that cork company will pay me back uh, for the bottle of wine that was corked. Uh, they, they're that strong, they believe that strongly in their technology in preventing cork taint. What I think is sad is that there are wineries out there that actually are willing to accept a certain level of cork taint. Um, I have a friend who focuses more on their packaging than their finished product. And we used to buy a lot of their wine and then we found out that we were getting more and more corked bottles and we were skiing one year and I said, Hey, I've been seeing more and more corked bottles. He goes, well, yeah, it's a lot cheaper for me to buy cheaper corks and I'm willing to accept three or four bottles per case as being corked. Besides the price range of my wine, most of my customers can't tell. And to me, that's sad. And I went down too far a rabbit hole. So I'm going to get off of that. Um, any questions on cork taint, Paula? You're smiling at me. <laughs> you're going so fast. Um, you're going down the rabbit hole, honey. Um, so someone asked about uh, soft and crumbling corks. Does that mean that there's gonna the wine is going to be bad because it's soft and crumbling? Uh, someone else asked about recycling corks. What do they do? Um, a lot of stores are re are uh, recycling corks. 
And then how do you choose the lots? Um, and maybe you already answered this. And what range of TCA do you find in the trials that you do? Sure. Soft and crumbling, recycling, and how do we choose lots? So a soft and crumbling does not necessarily mean that wine is shot. Uh, sometimes it can be just an older wine. Actually, we last week we had our 1995 Cabernet up on a flash sale for Napa Valley Vintners Association for their out of the cellar promotion. And I intentionally, when we shipped this 95 vintage to people, I told them be sure to use an also when you open this bottle of wine. And also that's the opener that has two prongs and it goes down on either side of the cork. Instead of going through the cork, it comes on either side of the cork and then you slowly twist to pull it out. So I would highly recommend using an opener like an also pretty much for any wine older, older than 10 to 15 years. Uh, we opened up a bottle of 2000 dedication on Sunday night, and that's the first time I had to use an also on it. Another opener that I highly recommend if you enjoy uh, drinking older wines is called a Durand. I believe it's spelled D U R A N D. And the Durand is a hybrid of a corkscrew and an also. It comes in two parts. The first, you put down a screw all the way through the cork. And then it has an also attachment on the other side and you use both devices at the same time. So the problem with an also is sometimes the bottom of the cork can fall off. So the Durand allows you to bring out the cork more completely. So a crumbling cork is not necessarily a sign that the wine has gone bad. I actually, about 30 years ago, we had an incident with some a winery where they were purchasing corks from a German company. So they were buying the slabs and shipping them all the way to Germany to be processed. And I never found out exactly what happened, but those corks actually became spongy over time and leaked. And unfortunately I left that winery, so I never got to see the result and how that was uh, taken care of. As for recycling, yes, many stores are offering recycling. And the most common thing you can do with that is um, what they'll do with that is make cork boards or other cork products that could even be pressed into cork flooring. Uh, cork flooring is very sustainable because it's primarily recycled corks. Um, actually, the next slide, I'm going to show you what agglomerated and technical corks look like. Now, those can't be made from recycled corks because it's just not sanitary to take used cork and make it into new corks again. And it's also not cost effective to ship it all the way back to a factory and grind them all up and re-sterilize them as well. How do I choose lots? Well, um, I kind of have evolved into a much more simple method. I request samples from my cork supplier that are representative of a lot. I request what's called a SPEMI. And the SPEMI is an abbreviation. It's essentially the parts per billion present of TCA in that cork lot. And I will only purchase um, lots where there is no TCA detected. Uh, you can buy much cheaper lots of corks where they actually detect one to 10 parts per billion TCA. You can purchase lots of corks that are just below the same threshold. Uh, I'm not going to go there. Now you can also request soak tests where they will take that lot and soak it in a neutral white wine and then you go through and smell all those wines to look for any cork taint or other off aromas from that cork. I used to work at a winery where we would do those with every single lot and one night when I couldn't sleep I actually pulled out my old statistics textbook and realized that for the size, the sample size they were getting from the cork suppliers, that the test they were doing, that me as an intern, I was spending probably 30 hours a week preparing these samples, uh, the results were statistically insignificant. Uh, the chances of us getting a false positive or a false negative 
were higher than actually getting an accurate result. So my key thing is I deal with reputable suppliers. And to be honest, it's more of a beauty pageant. Uh, for dedication for Gate and for Monterre for those 54 millimeter corks, I usually purchase whatever their top grade is. For all of our other products, I just take one step back from that. There is no uniform grading system in the cork industry. They all have their proprietary names, and one cork supplier may only have three grades, another cork supplier may have 10 grades. And within those grades, then you can purchase the lots. And the lots are where um, you can vary dramatically on your TCA testing. I also submit to a cork supplier before I do business with them that this is the moisture content I expect in the cork. This is the ovality I insist in a cork. Even though a cork appears to be round, is it a perfect circle? Not necessarily. If their dye that's punching these corks has a little bit of a wobble, they can have a slight ovality to it. So over the last 30 years, I've developed a spec sheet that my cork suppliers have to adhere to. Anything else? I'm gonna move on because it might answer the questions that are sitting out there. And also, I'm kind of running long right now, so hopefully I haven't lost too many of you. Um, corks are interesting to me, usually because Paul is usually telling me to stick a cork in it. Uh, so I just want to show you more carefully what these other products are. Uh, so on the left is what's called agglomerated cork, and on the right is a technical cork, where they actually will take an agglomerated cork and glue a disc onto those. The agglomerated portion is made, so this answers the question, what do they do with this piece after they're done punching all the corks? Well, a couple of things. They'll actually shave off this outer layer of bark, and this can all get ground up and reused to make those agglomerated corks. Well, what do they do with the wood that's not even good enough quality to go into agglomerated corks? Those scraps actually will go all the way back down to that first processing facility. Remember where they're boiling the water? And they will use all that waste wood to power the flames to boil the water. So they're always thinking about how can we use every last scrap of this wood. I've never been a fan of agglomerated quirks. Uh, I th they don't have an expected lifespan and cork suppliers are always saying they're coming out with new bonding agents and they're new FDA approved. Uh, to me, I don't really want an unknown chemical and a woody substrate for too long in my wine. Corks. Now there's synthetic corks. They're inexpensive. They come in a variety of porosities. See, let me talk quickly about porosities. Um, you're probably all familiar with what happens when a wine gets oxidized. When the wine gets oxidized, it can turn brown. That's an extreme. It gets flabby. You lose the fruity. Well, oxidation is part of an equilibrium. And the other side of that equilibrium is reduction, the absence of air. And when a wine becomes reduced, it can pick up a skunky aroma. So cork actually is a semi-permeable membrane. I've actually had people, the same people who believe that there's no such thing as climate change and the earth is flat, uh, also will say, well, air can't get through a cork because if air can get through a cork, then the wine would leak out of the cork. And they don't understand the concept of semi-permeable membranes. Cork is a semi-permeable semi -permeable membrane. Say that three times fast. Ready? Go. I'll wait. Uh, synthetic corks can be made in different porosities to mimic the porosity of a cork. They can be printed to look like they're natural quirks. They can even be embossed with your, they can be embossed with a vintage here. They can have your name printed on them. Here's the major con. I already mentioned that the earliest verse of synthetic quirks, or as I call them, plastic plugs. Um, the, over time, the plastic that they're made out of 
can form a dielectric bond with the plastic, causing that cork to adhere to the glass of the bottle, making the bottle difficult, if not impossible, to open. I'm afraid that many of you have had the displeasure of opening a bottle with synthetic cork and stretched out the screw of your favorite opener because the cork was, quite frankly, stuck in on the glass. Uh, and to me, you pull out a synthetic cork is very unimpressive. I'm going to argue to the end of the day that people don't like screw cap because it, you don't have the romance of pulling a cork anymore. Well, to me, there's no romance in a bottle you've been looking forward to for 10 years in your cellar and then finding it tainted. I also see no romance in struggling to pull a cork from a bottle. And when you're done pulling that cork, stretch your favorite cork throughout. Here, some people started working with glass stoppers. Um, I'll be frank, I'm not a fan of these. There is no gas exchange. Now, this is great for a short shelf life wine, like a Riesling that's going to be sold and consumed over the next six to eight months. But after that, the wine is going to turn reduced and it's going to develop those skunky aromas I mentioned earlier. Also, the seal on these is very fragile. You'll see that it's just a glass stopper with a little silicone ring, and that is held in place by the capsule. So the slightest ding at the top of that bottle is going to cause that stopper to come loose. Your wine may leak all over the floor in your car on the way home from the grocery store. Um, even worse, it might get dinged in shipping. And when you open it, find out the seal has been compromised for over three months and the wine is terribly oxidized. And that brings us to screw caps. And those of you who know our wines know I'm biased that I do like screw caps over those other closures. Um, you get a very consistent closure and you have a variety of permeabilities. And I have a slide coming up to show that. Uh, you get a consistent performance with no leaking as long as the bottling line is set up correctly and they're easy to open. The problem, the con, major con of screw caps is we do have to overcome the look of being cheap. Uh, now, this is a very interesting screw cap. This is the Stelden Lux. The black screw cap, used, that's the traditional Stelden Plus, and that's what we use here at Schweiger Vineyards. The screw cap actually does not have threads in it when it drops on the bottle. The crimper actually crimps. There's a two-stage a two roller. The bottom stage crimps this skirt in here, that holds the bottom of the screw cap on after you apply the screw cap. The top crimp actually folds the tin bottle. In this new Stelvin Lux, the threads are already cast in a soft rubber on the inside. So it's actually threaded on. So you don't have the threads showing and you don't have the knurling on the screw cap. So it's a much more polished finish. The challenge with screw caps like this is the number of people who destroy a perfectly good knife trying to cut this capsule or if they're trying to just sometimes people will pull a cork without even taking the uh, uh, capsule off and they'll wind up destroying some of their favorite cork screws because they just went through solid tin and no cork. So there's all of our choices. Uh, the big problem facing natural cork, in addition to TCA, is that it is a natural product. Somebody asked their question earlier, that the cork over time can start to crumble and fall apart, fall apart. Porosity in the cork can vary tremendously on how well the lot of corks is sorted and the variety of forests they came from. In a tree that grows very fast, you're going to have growth rings wider apart. In a very slow growing tree, the growth rings are going to be narrower. So in a slower growing tree, you're going to have a denser cork that's going to form a more tight seal. It's going to have less porosity, whereas a fast growing tree is going to have more, more, be more porous to air. Uh, I already explained the redox equation. So let's take a case of Cabernet, for example and you lay that case down for a decade. In the most extreme, 
will have a lower gas exchange rate and have a tighter nose and tannin structure. The same case, you could pull a bottle of wine with a cork with a coarser grain, and that may appear to be tired, flabby, and oxidized because more air was able to come in. I'm not saying one bottle is better than the other, but you're going to have a wide variability in that case of wine. Um, so that's a challenge that we face with cork. Does that mean I'm gonna switch everything over to screw cap tomorrow? Uh, Paula, I'm not even looking at her monitor, but it's probably shaking her head violently. There still is a preconception that we have to overcome with screw cap. Um, I someday see potential, and we'll get into that later, uh, but I think one important thing to note is that a winemaker can't simply wake up one day and switch closures. The less air your closure allows, the more careful you have to be in your winemaking process to avoid oxidative practices because nature likes to be the equilibrium. And a screw cap, depending on the liner you use, we'll get into that in a moment, the less air that's going to be allowed in there is going to push more to that reductive side. If your winemaking practices, especially in the month or two leading up, are more oxidative, it's picture there's a rubber band holding this straight up equilibrium. If you're the slightest bit oxidative, it's going to shoot back into that reduced side. So actually, Becca and I just brought the Sauvignon Blanc, 2020 Sauvignon Blanc up the tank yesterday, and we were very cautious to avoid any air exposure to that because that is going to be going down to screw cap, much like the last 14 years vintages of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, to avoid any oxidation so that it won't get skunky. Now I mentioned liners. Um, there's a misconception with screw caps that wine closed and screw tap tastes metallic because the wine has been against metal. The wine never actually comes into contact with the tin of the screw cap. Uh, it comes into contact with a liner. And there's several different liners today that we can utilize. And the two primary ones are Serenex and Saran Tin. Saran Tin is the first one we started working with at Schweiger Vineyards because it has a very low oxygen permeability. Uh, you start out with a layer of foam, extended polyethylene, which its trade name is Serenex. And then you have layers of a little bit of white craft paper, tin for rigidity, but it has no contact because you have polyvinyl dichloride, a, P, a polymer here. It's essentially the same polymer as saran wrap, hence saran tin. The tin gives it rigidity. It also helps keep out any gas exchange. Now, Saranex, on the other hand, is allows for a small amount of oxygen permeability because it is that same disc, layers of polyethylene, as well as that same saran polymer. So it's actually almost as if you had a micro perforated piece of plastic that allows a small amount of gas exchange within that screw cap. The only other thing I haven't mentioned about cork is that it is a woody matrix and over time, some aromatic esters of lighter aromatics can be absorbed into the cork. This became keenly aware to me around 03 or 04. We've been doing Sauvignon Blanc here for about three or four years. And I was noticing that the Sauvignon Blanc was not as vibrant as it was the day we bottled them. And the more I read about this, I realized that I was losing these esters, these delicate aromas into the cork. So in 2006, uh, we took the plunge in the screw cap and selected that saran tin liner I showed you earlier for the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, again, that wasn't an overnight decision. We made subtle changes starting all the way at harvest, uh, blanketing the juice in the press pan with CO2, uh, frequently, more frequently gassing the juice while it was settling with carbon dioxide. Uh, we use extended leaves contact the dead yeast cells at the bottom of the barrel actually will scavenge oxygen as it comes into contact with the wine. And then a greater use of argon to blanket the wine in the days leading up to bottling. You know, because my intention is 
I want the Sauvignon Blanc to be enjoyed in the first six to 18 months after bottling. So we went with a Saran 10 liner. Excuse me. My concern is that these wines aged much longer under the Saran tin might start to become reduced. That's why I saw a couple earlier talked about they had, I think, a 2015 uh, bottle of Sauvignon Blanc. Over time, it might start to get a little bit of a asparagus brine, skunky aroma. Now, that may not be bad. That might just be more New Zealand in style. But it's not the way that we intended for the wine to be enjoyed. And that's just the nuance of it. But quite frankly, in my opinion, Sauvignon Blanc is a enjoy within two years of the harvest it was made in. But that's my opinion. So after the amazing response by our wine club members to Sauvignon Blanc, uh, I was dreading pushback. And the only pushback we got was from somebody who complained that they ruined a perfectly good knife removing the capsule, only to find out there was no cork inside the bottle of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, no pushback. So we decided with the 2010 vintage to move our Chardonnay into screw cap as well. But we chose the Saranex liner that does allow for more gas exchange. And to me, these Chardonnays under screw cap are still aging beautifully. I opened a bottle of 2011 Chardonnay from Carolina, and it was aging beautifully. And that's the thing. These liners have a track, rec track record going back to the 70s. And I have had the privilege of tasting 25, 30 year old Syrahs from New Zealand that have been closed under screw cap. And wines will age gracefully under screw cap. They'll age differently because the porosity of the closure is the same, so they're gonna age more consistently. So I do see a potential for aging wines under screw cap. And that brings us to where we are today. We have at Schweiger Vineyards a mix of natural cork and screw cap, but they're selected for each particular wine and how we want those wines to be enjoyed. What's the future hold? Is there a Schweiger red wine under screw cap? I'm waiting to see Paula shake her head violently, but she isn't that time. Um, I never say never. At this point, I'm extremely pleased with my relationship with M.A. Silva, with Cork Supply USA, and the small handful of other suppliers I work with. There is no shortage of natural cork at the quality and price range we're shopping in. Uh, cork for Cabernet and Merlot and Cabernet Franc is typically 90 cents to a dollar ten a cork. For dedication, gate block and Monterrey, it's about a dollar eighty to two dollars and forty cents per cork, and that depends what the euro is doing. Um, so, I have no change plan on changing in the near future. However, we do have a small project coming up in the next few years, and I am strongly considering and am making our new line of Pinot Noirs with the intention of those being closed and screwed cap. I still have time to make that decision, well over a year, and I would love to get feedback from our wine club members and our longtime fans. So if you have any feedback about Schweiger Pinot Noir under a screw cap, I'd love to get an email from you to the family at schweigervineyards.com with your opinion. Any other questions or comments on what we've done, Paula? Um, yes. Which is more cost effective, uh, cork or screw cap? And then would a slower growing tree have, have less lent cells? Um, what is more cost effective? Well, <laughs> if you're just looking at the bottom line, screw cap. Uh, I told you how much our corks are, anywhere from $1.50 to $2.80 per cork. A uh, screw cap is only about 18 cents. And the tin in the screw cap is much more recyclable. That tin can be easily melted down and reprocessed and could be part of your next Tesla. The cork has its life as a cork board or a floor, and there's a lot of energy that has to be, go into reproducing the cork. Um, but you can't also buck fish in, and you can't jump too, too far ahead of technology. And my job is not necessarily always to be cost effective and for the cheapest products, but what our 
club members and our fans want. And what was the second, or did I hit it already? I think I got it. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in, but wait, there is more. Uh, Fly With Wine is offering an additional, well, a 25% discount for people who viewed the webcast today. So if you had been looking at the suitcase and you wanted it, uh, go to flywithwine.com, use the promo code Schweiger-T for a 25% discount. I believe that is good for today. It might be good for the next 12 hours. I never did hear back on that. So um, it looks good. I was actually talking to my mom today and we're gonna be buying a couple of these and this isn't a paid sponsorship. They just said, hey, would you like a bag to give away? So um, Michael Sullivan, I hope, did, did Michael ever chime up that he's here? He did, awesome. Well, I hope you enjoy that bag. Um, just in case you weren't, uh, we did pull a runner up and I was so excited when you pro randomly popped up. Uh, William McKinley is a longtime club member from uh, Georgia and has been chiming in, checking in up on Jerry. So uh, hopefully next time we have a giveaway. Uh, last thing, just wanted to let you know about our upcoming web webisodes, uh, Thursday, April 9th. I have good news for you all. You get a day off from me. Uh, I decided to focus on dad and bring in my assistant winemaker, Becca. So I'm going to be shooting them out in the vineyard and showing you guys what's happening out in the vineyard right now. The weather forecast looks good. We won't be dumped on with rain. Uh, thankfully, we've had some rain here the past few days and let you know what's going on out in the vineyard. Then Monday, April 13th, we're going to be doing a virtual tasting of our 2017 Chardonnay as well as our 2016 Family Cuvée with Gordon Goodwin and Banji Gunn. Uh, for those of you who know me well, know that I love music. I grew up listening to Rob McConnell and the Boss Brass until the needle wore out. Uh, transitioned into Rob McConnell on cassette tapes until the tape stretched out. And in 2001, I found somebody shared Gordon Goodwin's Big Fat Band with me and my mind was blown. And I follow Gordon on Facebook and I reached out to him asking if he'd be interested in doing one of these tastings. And he actually replied and we started exchanging emails. Uh, I didn't sleep for a night or two, I was so excited. And Vanji Gunn has been singing with the Big Fat Band since they recorded their last album. And she is an amazing vocalist. So tune in Monday, April 13th. Both shows are going to be at three o'clock Pacific. And Gordon and Vanjie are going to play a couple songs for us, and we're going to pop open some wines and enjoy. So until next time, thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and stay safe and stay healthy.